Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this DevOps.com webinar. I'm Sam Fell. Uh, Alan Schimmel is actually in San Francisco. I saw him last night at his Wine Not Whining happy hour at the RSA conference, which was absolutely fantastic. So he's not able to join us. But I am here, uh, if you could change the slide, I am here with Jane Grohl, uh, the CEO of DevOps Institute, and Evelyn Orlick, the research director who's helping out with this upskilling um, DevOps survey. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about the, the survey and the work that Jane and Evelyn have done to gather these metrics. Um, and you're probably thinking to yourself, why is Electric Cloud so interested in a survey? And I was thinking about that. I have the opportunity to um, say a couple things before we get into the content, but actually, uh, can you do? Can you hit next uh, three times for me, Jane? One, two, three. Fantastic. So, if you think about the stuff that people need in order to quote unquote do the DevOps, um, classically, people talk about CAMs, culture automation, measurement, and sharing. People talk about people and process and tools. Uh, they also, if you click one more time, they talk about continuous improvement, a spirit of continuous improvement. And if you look at the ecosystem that we play in. Electric Cloud is obviously in the application release orchestration space. We help people release software into production. So there's a lot of work that we do focused around tooling and tools and integrating with different things, adding ML and AI to that process. We obviously, there's been a ton of continuous improvement in process, um, continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, blue green deployments, all these sorts of methodologies that people are continuously innovating on to try and make software delivery faster and safer uh, for the community. The one thing where we see a big opportunity, and Jane and the folks at the DevOps Institute, I think, agree, is making sure that the people part of this are not left behind. Uh, humans are a critical part of DevOps, and so it's very important to us to make sure that they are getting the skills and the information that they need to be able to keep up with sort of that state of change of always changing processes and technologies. So if the next slide. Yep, oh, sorry. That's okay. Getting there. Oh. Yep. So we can actually just skip this slide is fine and go right to the next one. So again, we're, we're really, really proud to be sponsoring um, the DevOps Skills Survey with the DevOps Institute. Uh, we also do some work with the DevOps Institute once we understand where these skill gaps are. Uh, we do have a solution to help organizations that are out there that are trying to get their teams up and running with um, more DevOps principles, more of that growth mindset to try and solve some of those problems. With Electric Cloud University, we're using the DevOps Institute's learning management system as our back end. Subscription-based training and certification um, with practitioner-focused content. Uh, from product perspective, as well as just from a gen general DevOps sort of foundational knowledge perspective. Um, and we do on-site workshops as well. So we're really excited to be able to bring this to uh, the market and to the public to help fill the gaps that Jane and Evelyn are actually gonna talk about right now. So again, super excited to be able to welcome uh, everybody to the webinar and more excited to hear about these results from this pretty amazing survey. So Jane, do you wanna take it away and talk a little bit about DevOps Institute? Sure, thanks Sam. And you know, as you said, we're so proud to be working with Electric Cloud um, as part of our ecosystem to really look at what are the critical skills and how do we help close the skills gap in the DevOps community. If you're not familiar with DevOps Institute, we really are an association for DevOps professional. We're an open community that really looks at continuous learning as a lifestyle. And so we hope we've been able to bring to the, uh, to the DevOps market innovative, inspirational, and transformational networking and career growth opportunities. You know, when we, we sort of launched the idea for this survey, we know that there's a lot of surveys and research out there about organizational performance. And uh, many of the research sectors have really looked at, you know, high performing organizations and what is the adoption rate of DevOps uh, on a global level, particularly in the enterprise, in the enterprise verticals. 
but there really wasn't a lot of research about skills. And so time after time, we hear about T-shaping, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. We hear about skills transformations, we hear about talent gaps, and we know that there's a huge talent shortage when it comes to digital transformation. So really starting this project, along with my good friend, Evelyn Orlick, who I've known for a long time when she was still at Forrester, really hoping to bring some value and some insight and most importantly, I think some benchmarking against what does the community consider uh, critical skills from multiple perspectives, from the perspective of the C-suite, from the management layer, and from the practitioner layer. So very excited that it released yesterday, really hoping that the data is deep and that it helps individuals, the humans of DevOps, grow their careers and support their organizational efforts. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Evelyn, who's going to really help us understand more about what the, the data revealed and some of the direction it provided. So Evelyn, welcome. Super, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Sam, for this wonderful introduction and uh, everybody else listening here on today on our webinar. Very excited um, about this data. And um, as Jane said, we met actually last year at DAS in uh, London and said, what if, and we made it work. So congratulations to all of us. It was quite fun work, but also was hard work. Before we get into the details, I wanted to take you a bit on a on a journey. And um, Jane, of course, is the, the woman behind the clicking on the slides. So if I have to say <laughs> next slides, then just bear with us because somehow my German slide machine here isn't working. Anyway, so quickly, transformation history. If you look at uh, into the past, um, you know, first, second, third revolution, of course, <laughs> I don't think Maybe some of us have, have been around, but steam and water and power and electronics and then IT, all of that improved a quality of life and there was a lot of expansion on government and companies. Now, digital revolution, um, we, we, we are actually in it. We are experiencing changes, cloud, IoT, uh, the speed and the quality of services of what our customers, your customers, and we ourselves as consumers want uh, has changed and customer experience is the number one um, metric really in many organizations. What we're heading to is, um, and some organizations are already there, of course, the fourth revolution, uh, a lot of talk in Europe and industry 4.0, of course, in the US and the rest of the world, but this includes AI, robotics, machine learning, bots, as you heard it, advanced working and living, and it requires a, a different change in society, a different experience. That's all very important and a very important backdrop to some of the trends we're seeing worldwide. So here again, this is from the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's only a few hours from here, from where I live here in Europe. Two key trends. The first one is the global workforce changes. So there is a lot of socioeconomic drivers. Um, you have experienced them maybe already, you're seeing them in your company, maybe with your children, uh, those, those studying teenagers as I have them. So the nature of work, um, there is a lot of uh, middle class emerging. So those are some of the socio socioeconomic drivers. And then the technology drivers, we're very familiar with those. I don't have to belabel those. And then the skill stability, some of the business model changes, including IoT and some of the technology changes causes the change in business models and that causes a huge skill set disruption. And last but not least, um, the technology, which is happening at a very fast speed, is changing or shortening the shelf life of existing skills we have. So if we go to the next slide, here are some additional details, which again are from the World Economic Forum. The good news is that the future workforce strategies uh, and industry overall, here is the respondents from uh, this survey they had done at the World Economic uh, Forum. You, you can see there is an incredible reinvesting or investing in reskilling current employees um, and, and a variety of other things. Um, for me, important target female talent, number four there, but for some of you, maybe not as important, but very interesting. That's the good news. 
If you go to the next slide, um, unfortunately, there is also uh, some challenges here. And again, when they were asking about what are some barriers to change, the overall response here that there is a significant number two challenge in, uh, restraint uh, or currency in resources. So there's just not enough resources available. And, and that, unfortunately, um, is, is the challenge of those folks um, who are leading in uh, in the World Econo Economic Forum. And again, the folks there, you, you probably have maybe seen the news when that happened. Lots and lots of uh, famous people. Now, what does this have to do with us? Well, if we look at the next slide, there is the good news and the bad news. But the good news, really, because I am the only, I think I'm the only internal German optimist, is that the DevOps jobs in 2019 are in hot demand. So there are lots and lots of people looking for lots, a lot of company looking for DevOps people. If I done the research quickly, Glassdoor says top 10 notable tech toll, tech role. Oh, tech tolls. That's a nice, uh, nice typo. <laughs> Top 10 notable tech role in demand is the DevOps and Robert Half, also a recruiting company. The seventh most wanted professional is the DevOps profession. So with that backdrop, I think um, we certainly wanted to understand, OK, what does that mean? What are people uh, doing in terms of uh, hiring? So to get some idea in our survey, we asked um, what steps in your organization are you taking or planning to take to expand the DevOps team or teams? And you can see here 37% of our respondents were actually hiring. Um, they're currently hiring. And then there's plenty more who plan to recruit. Um, and then there's a few who don't know what they're doing, which is hopefully those folks by the end of this conversation, if you're listening in and if you don't know, you might already, uh, you might change your mind and you're thinking in terms of DevOps hiring. Now, we asked and wanted to know what are some of the popular titles. Um, and here you can see the different titles um, and the percentage of respondents. Um, I've done a lot of reading and research around, uh, of course, is, is DevOps engineer the right title? I, I do believe it is, as, as so do our survey respondents. They said 39% say that DevOps engineer is the right title. But there is an existence of additional um, titles there. You can see software engineer, DevOps consultant, test engineer, automation architect, and so on. All can become and are part of the DevOps team, potentially. One of the things, uh, Evelyn, this is Sam, sorry, if you can go back. One of the things that I'm very excited about seeing over time is how these titles are going to shift around. For instance, um, site reliability engineer. Are we going to see more of those next year or less? System administrator. Are we going to see more of those next year or less? So for the folks who are listening, um, directionally speaking, what areas of this business, if you're looking to upskill yourself, which areas of the business make sense for you to go in having that velocity and that vector, the directional vector of that data, I think is going to be very interesting for people. And we can take some bets on that. I almost bet that the system administrator will go down next year, and I'm putting a nice case of champagne on that bet. But we won't know uh, until next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would not, I'm not going to take you on that bet. I don't want to bet against you on that one. <laughs> oh, too bad. Well, you know, Thank you. If I can go just ahead, jump in conversation you know one of the things I find interesting is well there's a lot of emphasis on no ops and of course many of you know that I've been working with some others on shaping new ops operations really makes a strong presence here right so looking at kind of cross functionality where you know test engineers and test driven deployment are going to show up as you know part of that kind of t-shaping approach where it isn't just a single specialty anymore uh, you know the system administrator whether it rises or falls is still going to need to learn how to code and developers are going to need to know how to test so I think that's really interesting for us to look at year over year as well yeah yeah great comments super thank you so All right. um, let's talk a little bit about t-shaped professionals so um, this is a topic I'm really passionate about. And so I definitely see a movement, and I think the, the survey results really demonstrate that, that there is an evolution of the IT professional from the specialist to what we now call the T-shaped. 
practitioner, right? Where specialists have deep knowledge about a, a, a single competency. So if you're a software developer, or you're an infrastructure engineer, or you're a DBA, or any of the myriad of specialties that are associated with IT, we grew IT up to be an organization of specialists, but we found out that there were constraints associated with it. So the concept of the T-shaped professional, I think is actively hired. Um, you know, I'd be interested in, in Sam and Evelyn's perspective on that. But for those of you not familiar about T-shaping, the stem of the T is your specialty. And of course you can have multiple specialties and that would make you cone-shaped, pie-shaped, right? Um, pie Mm. Yeah, you'd be pie shaped if you had two, you'd be comb shaped if you had more than two. But for today, let's focus on just one, right? So the stem of the T is your deep knowledge about a particular competency. But you need to supplement that with the top of your T and a broad range of other skills. So uh, an artist friend of mine used a great analogy and said, I'm primarily a painter, but I do need to understand how to work with clay and metals and other domains so that I can add that to my painting. Well, it's the same thing here. If we think about IT as an art, we need to be able to supplement our core skill with other skills like testing or coding or infrastructure, or you know, in the case of site reliability engineering, really looking at some automation tools. And in the case of course, DevOps engineering, really looking at what type of, of continuous, whatever that continuous is, all the way up through release automation and into production. So the goal here is to be able to, to identify how do you fill the top of your T? Sam, do you want to add anything to that? No, I definitely think that having that broad knowledge and being able to uh, find opportunities to broaden your knowledge. Um, I wouldn't say you need a veneer or a patina of knowledge, but you, you just need to be able, you know, people I think who are going to really be successful are those that know how to learn and who put themselves in situations where they're able to sample from a large variety of skills um, in a, in a sort of a can do roll up your sleeve sort of way and not a hypothetical metaphorical way right um, actually implementing monitoring is different than watching somebody talk about how they implemented monitoring and having an ex you know exposure to all these different skills um, is I think going to be very very useful for people as they move forward in their careers excellent and I want to make sure I call out if you have questions make sure you ask those questions we'll be able to answer those um, while either while we go along or at the end of our uh, webinar here. All right, let's continue. Thanks, Jane, for this. So before we um, dived into, of course, our survey, we needed to determine some categories. And um, here are the four key categories we wanted to dive into further, soft skills. Um, we always heard, yeah, you need soft skills. Everybody knows that. But what are the soft skills, right? Functional know-how. What are the functional know-how areas um, which are important? And which ones are must have versus nice to have technical skills of course on some of them you probably could have guessed and i won't give anything away if i say cloud 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 but still there is additional things to know in the technologies than just cloud and then process skills process and framework skills um, so those are the four categories which we developed our survey questions and our details around now there is a difference between knowledge and skill and ability and i i really love this because I use this also with my my daughters who both are going to uh, to school in the U.S. Knowledge is really the practical is the practical and or the theoretical understanding of a topic. That's what we gain when we take a course. We, we do some some work. Skill is actually the things which we learn through training and or through experience. So, for example, myself, I used to learn. I had the knowledge of DBA, but as a as a DBA, I gained the skill to actually work uh, across an application which used Oracle or whatever database. And then the ability is something uh, is the level of being able to perform, do or deliver a task. Now, how you obtain those is a little different. As I said, knowledge is learning, training, and experience. Practicing and learning 
you can do to a skill, but an ability most of the time is a natural thing. So you might have some knowledge and skills, but you might also have some abilities which you can then leverage to gain additional skill and additional knowledge. And that is really important when you think about Jane's uh, uh, T, T shape, um, you can actually expand from whatever you have in an ability or in a skill or in a knowledge. Um, so that's just a backdrop for that. And we took this into consideration when we looked at the data. Now, to survey demographics, we had fantastic respondents. We had more than 1,600 across the world. Um, lots of people to thank. Um, of course, Electric Cloud with their support. Um, many folks out there who may be listening in today, if you have helped us Twitter and tweet, thank you. Um, you can see the geographical distribution here. Lots of uh, North American uh, regions, Europe, Latin America, India, APEC, and China. Some areas a little more hesitant to answer surveys, but that's typical in my experience of 13 years of being an analyst. Let's see what else we have here. Now, quickly, just highlighting, and you have a, a possibility to look at these later on, the differences in terms of the respondent profiles. We had all kinds of folks, individual contributors, as well as management. We had companies of all sizes, and we had companies of all, uh, in terms of revenue and in, in terms of people. We also wanted to make sure in the next slide, you can see the dis distribution relative to their environment because we felt it was important to um, get a good uh, mix relative to their environment uh, of IT organizations. It, it shouldn't just be the modern, like you know, it shouldn't just be hybrid. It should also be a mix, and we got that. And then the respondent profile, we didn't just want application development folks or just infrastructure folks because that would highly skew the, the research and the findings. So you can see there we got a pretty good breakup or breakdown of the different roles relative to the fo functions or roles inside the IT organization. All right, let's click further down into the details because this is really important. Um, we found that, and this wasn't a surprise to me because this is similar to some of the research uh, I have done previously, we found the different stages or the the state of DevOps organizations um, to be enterprise adoption, meaning full end-to-end -end DevOps was 19% in terms of our survey respondents. 43% adopted DevOps at the project level, 15% were still at the planning stage, and then 11% are planning to adopt this in the future. So again, with these planning to adopt in the future, many of those are looking for the DevOps individual. Um, and then, of course, some project level might shift into enterprise, but not necessarily. So this is a, an, an additional backdrop to understand who was part of the survey. All right, as uh, I used to live in Colorado, we usually uh, climb a mountain first, but today we're actually descending the mountain. We're getting further and further into details. Um, so first we were curious about the bigger, the bigger skill categories or the categories. What were some of the differences in terms of uh, the, the categories? So we asked the question, how would you rate the importance of the following categories, the ones I showed you earlier? And you can see here that automation is absolutely one of the top must have skills. And again, must, imp must have or very important um, then important, which was nice to have, and then not important, which was optional. You can see here in the color coding, and it's consistent across all the slides, so you can remember that. This was quite, um, that was a surprise, and it wasn't. I used to have a colleague who used to say, uh, become the automator, not the automated, and I really like that statement, and it has stayed with me ever since, and this is really uh, important here, having automation skills, um, and then, of course, with it coupled, you must have process skills because, again, automating a mess will create an additional mess. So without understanding processes and having the knowledge on how to decipher process and reduce the waste, um, you won't be able to actually automate. So you can see the, the respondents agreed with us there or, or, or said that. And third, most important, soft skills. Um, 
again, you might say, scratch your head going, hello, Evelyn, we knew that, but stay tuned because we have some click down details on soft skills. So the top three categories of skills, really automation skills, process skills and process knowledge and soft skills. I'll pause, anything, any comments from you, Jane or Sam? If not, I can continue and you can comment on the next slide. Yeah? yeah. All no right. For me. Yeah. Now, again, as I said, we wanted to see, was there a difference between um, the management level, or the C, so I should say C level, and the management level and the individual contributors. So we took our skill categories and broke it down relative to those three categories of individuals or, or, or roles in from our survey. And I circled those which I found were very interesting. Um, sort of, again, process skills, you can see process and knowledge, almost all three uh, groups feel the same for the must have skill of process skills and knowledge. But automation, the C level, um, Definitely much, much higher response relative to having automation as a must-have skill compared to those who are in management. Those are typically project leads or VPs and the individual contributors. On functional knowledge, a C-suite obviously doesn't value functional knowledge as much as, of course, the individual contributor. That's fairly, fairly natural. Uh, specific automation tools are little difference there between um, the management and the must-have and Sam most mostly important to you as you can see here the C-suite thinks that specific automation tool must-have is a must-have skill so that's a good one for your C-level conversations um, and your management conversations of, of the tools. On the specific certification, and Jane, I'll leave that up to you to make a comment there because I know you have one. Business skills and soft skills, again, um, C-level and management value soft skills tremendously. They think those are must-have skills when you are uh, becoming or are having uh, achieving or wanting to achieve the DevOps as a profession. Business skills, in this case, actually business skills means just a typical acumen of business skills. This is different from business knowledge. So business skills is just the standard, um, how do I how do I contribute to business? What does business entail, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, individual contributors um, don't think that business skills is a must have. So here you, you see management and C-level certainly thinks it is. Now, Jane, I make a comment to, uh, I leave the comment on the certifications to you. So I think that's very, very interesting. I mean, you definitely can see areas where there's agreement on the different types of skill categories and you can see where there's a, a difference there. And I'll be interested to see how this changes year over year. So I find it fascinating that the C-suite and the management have a slightly different perspective on certifications. I think that when we look at DevOps certifications, particularly those uh, coming from DevOps Institute, which are very skill-based, management's going to be likely the hiring managers, right? They're gonna be the ones trying to validate that an individual has or does not have the skill, particularly because we know today that the standard for standard definition for say a DevOps engineer isn't really agreed upon. So I think when we see the management level uh, with a slight rise in that, it's because again, they're comparing the resume of potential talent and trying to figure out uh, whether one one individual has demonstrated uh, that that skill compared to somebody who who hasn't. Again, I'm really interested in this uh, year over year. I'm also really fascinated by the whole soft skills uh, piece because I think that when we start to look at the C-suite and the management layer, they need to understand that they have cohesive teams, right? They need to understand that bringing in people with natural collaboration skills or the ability to communicate well, or just good team players, right, is very critical to the smooth operation and of course the faster pace of software delivery. Individual contributors, I think, think it's important, but they don't necessarily uh, see the bigger picture of that. And I think that speaks very much to cultural transformation, which we in DevOps know is a critical success factor. Sam, what do you think? 
Yeah, I definitely think that that um, the soft skills. I actually was just seeing um, our friend Mike Cavus over from Deloitte. He's tweeting about that as well. Uh, these soft skills. It's a very important part of that whole equation, um, and giving people the ability to sort of experiment and and try out different things um, in a in a safe place. I think is is also very critical to allow people to grow and become sort of more adept at trying new things it's not you know trying new things is not um in a lot of people's nature because they're afraid of having problems occur so you have to figure out a way to enable that collaboration and support those people to do those things yeah absolutely i love that comment sam trying new things that could actually be a hiring incentive um as i was speaking to quite a few recruiters on mm. some detailed interviews um some of them had challenges because there's a lot of competition out there for people so trying new things and making that as a marketing slogan for hiring devops people is actually quite attractive i mm. actually would love that so great great comment all right thank you both Let's click further down in, um, in our details. As I said, we're descending the mountain. Let's look at the process skills in details. And again, same principle here on blue being must have, orange being nice to have, and uh, gray, the color depicted on purpose to be gray of optional. So we asked, how would you rate the importance of the following process and framework skills for a DevOps team member? And um, ta-ta, the top uh, three, four, actually, let's, let's take the top three. The SDLC understanding and having that knowledge of how to do software development is still very, very important. And 46% think it is a must have and 49% said it's nice to have. Um, Second, understanding of process flow and analysis. Really, truly, those who are, and I want to call out to those folks, systems engineers and system designers or systems analysts, and I'm actually one of them myself, um, got my degree many years ago. I won't give away that year uh, as a systems designer and systems analyst. Those people understand process and flow and analysis, so a very important skill. And this one was a surprise to me. Actually, as I'm an operations person, it should have should be a surprise, but the experience with source control models and processes. So having that knowledge of where and how to manage source control or, or, or manage source and take care of that is also very important. Agile really wasn't a surprise because again, uh, Agile is, is, is there, it's, it's active, it's in the business, it's in IT, it's even uh, with my children, my students, uh, they're talking about Agile, which is great. Um, what I was a bit surprised as, and we discussed it as a team, are the bottom two, which is project management and program management. Um, you know, 16% said it was must have, and uh, uh, in terms of project program management and project management, 15%. But there was a, a lot of folks who said nice to have. So you're, you know, I don't want to say don't forget about your PMP or anything like that. It is certainly important. But if in the context of DevOps and what we are doing, the system thinking, the SDLC, the experience with source control and understanding process flow are much, much higher level and much more must have skills than anything else. All right, let's click further down the mountains. Now, we, we talked about soft skills and great comments there, um, but we were curious, what soft skills? And this one was to me uh, in many inquiries over many years in my previous position, um, I had a lot of questions about that. And again, for myself, as I continuously develop myself, um, it was important to understand. So here are some interesting um, results. Again, um, from top to bottom, Collaboration and cooperation, of course, nothing new. Most of you will say, yeah, 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 we've heard about that. Um, and problem solving, certainly a strength of those who are in operations, uh, because we operations folks are certainly folks um, who do problem solving all day long. Um, as a third, interpersonal skills. Now, this one is to be taken serious. Um, as we see organizations shift into DevOps, having a culture which has the sharing, the interpersonal skills, the flexibility, the adaptability, the creativity, the empathy is 
those are really the, the next click details which make up a DevOps culture. And I know there's tons of talk about the culture, but we never really had clearly the idea what are the must have skills to bring up that culture. Customer experience is beautiful and was really music to my ears because that really is and should be um, the measurement of the success of DevOps. The velocity, the speed, and the quality of the software we deliver is only as good as the customer experiences it. So having that understanding of what does impact the customer as it came in such high with 44% as a must-have skill was absolutely beautiful. Um, Diplomacy, leadership, business understanding, and so on. Risk taking came in with not as a big must have, but a certainly nice to have. This probably will, um, it probably is very depending on uh, the function and the particular uh, organization, but that was actually a surprise to me um, relative to the DevOps um, being so low in a, in a must have finding. Any comments from my colleagues here? So I have one, if you don't mind. So sure. you know, collaboration and cooperation, again, I don't think that comes as a huge surprise to anyone, but there really is a difference between collaboration and communication. And I think for those that are attending or listening later, that's really important to understand. It isn't uh, just getting along with other teams. It isn't, it isn't, necessarily, uh, you know, being a kind of passive communication, I tell you, you tell me, um, you know, we often talk about collaboration as the big difference there is, I actually ask your opinion, right? So I ask you what you think, and I, I respect your expertise as much as I respect my own, and therefore we collaborate on a solution because we co combine our expertise. So I'm really delighted to see collaboration and cooperation really at the top of the mountain uh, because I think that you know that really demonstrates the the goal of being able to increase flow by better uh, by better alignment, but I think more importantly by better respect. And it fits nicely with what you just said, Jane, to Sam's theme on continuous, right? Um, it, it is as we collaborate and as we cooperate, we can continue to develop ourselves and what we do and how we work. And I think that's the DevOps human as he or she develops. I think that adds to this continuous spectrum we discussed earlier. Super. All right, we're continuing. Sam, you will say if you have a comment, um, as I cannot see your eyes or your head shaking. I, I will <laughs> I will interject for sure. Okay. Super, <laughs> thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, we did the same um, exercise here. We took uh, the soft skills apart just so that you see what the differences are. Same principle as we looked at earlier. Um, here, customer experience skills, I'm extremely delighted that the C-suite thinks that this is a must have because of course they are responsible for revenue or if it's a nonprofit or government institution or whatever, they are responsible for that and are probably being either compensated uh, or not compensated on it, which is beautiful. However, the individual co contributor don't see that as a must have. So I highly wanna make sure, wanna put that at your heart, think about understanding what belongs into customer experience and how you can actually impact that. Um, creativity, um, this is back to trying new things, Sam, as you said so beautifully earlier, I love that comment. Um, the management suite and the C-suite thinks that creativity, and I think with it becomes that trying new things, um, not as much on the individual contributor, pretty close, uh, closer than, than the, the one above. And then the last one, flexibility and adaptability. Now, you can see this as a negative or a positive. I like to see that as a positive because the flexibility allows you, as C-Suite sees that as a must-have skill, allows you to actually become pretty versatile in many areas. You might be able to uh, take on particular uh, positions and build your T um, in, in certain areas, expanding on your T so that you become broader in certain areas, which is a great opportunity for those of us who are curious and are expandable and have an expandable mind. And the management supports that notion. 
Go to the next slide, there's more additional uh, highlights here. Empathy, having the empathy to relate to others goes back to having the right way to collaborate and cooperate. And of course, empathy also relates to the customer experience. So truly defining what is important versus what is not important. And you can see management and C-suite thinks that as a must have skill. Um, yeah. Share. Yes, go ahead, Sam. So we've got a question from uh, Sandeep who's asking, He's if you go back one slide, he's a little surprised, I guess, that there's only 30% um, for the individual contributor um, for the customer experience. And he's, I guess the question is, it's interesting. Do you have any thoughts about why that might be? I think it, it I think it has to do with the metrics to some extent in terms of how organizations and DevOps organizations are measuring still what they're doing. And many times in these teams, there is not a direct link to what is the outcome of a particular new whatever feature, new shopping cart item, et cetera, et cetera. And I did a lot of research around metrics. We're seeing more and more that DevOps organizations are expanding their metrics to also bring in the outside in perspective. But many times it's really all about, you know, just the, the ongoing, it's about speed, not as much on quality. And I, I, I always said speed, velocity is good, but speed without quality and velocity without quality doesn't certainly help us because then things don't get better. So no. I think that might be why you still see individual contributors as they don't get the, the direct feedback from the outcome be so low. Mm. Okay, makes sense. Great question. Continue to ask questions. I encourage you. Super. Thank you. Um, all right. We we looked at uh, empathy, knowledge sharing, and uh, sharing and knowledge transfer. You can see here. Um, the, 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 even so it came in as very high, um, you can see here that there is a difference between C-suite and management saying, hey, this is a, we really value this highly as a must have. Um, certainly 55% in the individual contributors say that, yes, uh, we see that as well, but I think hopefully next year we'll see that much higher and in line with what uh, the see that the others are are thinking problem solving same and then personal value and commitment those three things i think um we need to keep an eye on in our next survey and maybe actually do some some next next step research i've got some ideas already on how to explore that further on the others i think there is Pretty good balance between um, the different the different roles in terms of the soft skills. Any comments from you, Sam or Jane? No. All right, let's boogie. We are descending. We are in the um, we're in the base camp. Uh, one base camp. DevOps topology. We found uh, it was important to understand um, what is the topology makeup of our survey respondents. That you can see here, the majority of them had actually cross-functional team distributed among different IT teams and business units. That's the still the the viable topology with the second one, which is an on-project by-project based via DevOps service team. So a team which is I put aside with a variety of folks in it, sometimes called a product team, which actually does uh, DevOps around a particular project. It's important to, to understand that because it gives additional color to where our uh, survey respondents are. Okay. Next slide, Jane. Super. Now with this, backdrop of project by project uh, and the DevOps team as a service team, um, we were curious on how and what uh, folks thought about the functional skills. And again, I've outed myself already as an IT operations person, um, and I'm extremely delighted when we asked, how would you rate the importance of the following functional skills uh, for your DevOps team members? that 52% say that a must-have skill is the IT operations knowledge. And of course, 44% said it's nice to have. Um, infrastructure knowledge came in second. And most important here, and absolutely delighted about this as well, is the security practice. Um, we've seen a tremendous uh, uptake on 
you look into your email, you get a lot of emails on DevSecOps, uh, whatever you want to call it. So this is really important to recognize that security is part of this entire chain as we have become digital, as we are transforming digitally, as we are moving into this fourth, uh, 4.0, whatever you call it, security becomes important and having that as a must have skill in your in your in your expertise having that as a in your pocket is quite important of course application development and design uh, quality assurance and testing all as part of the devops tool chain and as the devops functional skills become important as well Jane, do you want to say anything about the gra um, or do we want to just uh, highlight that it certainly is nice to have, but governance, risk, and audits must have skill. Hasn't made it really into the top list, but it is a nice to have skill. Jane, do you want to add anything there? Yeah. Or? No, yeah, a couple of things there. So, uh, you know, several years ago, governance, risk, and compliance, or governance, risk, and audits was really top of mind. And compliance, governance were really directives. And I think in many cases, really drove things like ITIL and COVID and internal audit. Um, and regulatory compliance. I think what we're seeing across the verticals, though, is regulated uh, organizations are adopting DevOps despite the fact that governance, risk, and audit comes in as a nice to have, but not a not a high on the must have. Um, so it, I, I think it's definitely a paradigm shift that understands that you can still have compliance in a DevOps environment. Um, and you certainly can manage risk and have good governance, good IT governance, despite the fact that you're trying to go faster with more automation. And if you don't mind my sharing one other thing, you know, we had equal representation just about from development uh, developers and operational professionals, yet operational skills really rose up in the functional category, right? So even so you could say, well, it would be skewed because we had more operations folks complete the survey, but that's not that's not so. Um, it seemed like operations, infrastructure, and particularly security, right, where we're looking at security as code, and as you said, DevSecOps, becomes important to everyone, regardless of whether you're development, security, or operations. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Beautiful. All right, for time, time check, let's move on. Next, uh, technical details, of course, all of you out there who are uh, surprised now um, and not surprised about cloud platform and cloud environment. Um, I don't think I have to say anything additional there, but analytical knowledge and the experience with user interfaces, web, mobile, mobile tier, of course, very also very key in our environment um, of, of, of digital right specific frameworks um having ajax knowledge or soa or whatever dot net whatever environment is there um and then um interestingly to me still um artificial intelligence is not yet at the must-have level there's a lot of hyping on ai it's just like cloud washing we're doing ai washing now but there are some companies of course are finding that is an important skill and uh, but most majority says nice to have and then mainframe um, mainframe certainly is there it's part of there is a lot of research on devops on the mainframe and uh, actually was one of our best read research reports way back when i was the forester research and all of us were very happy about that but mainframe's knowledge is still there uh with 57 percent saying optional and 11 percent saying it's a must-have all right next slide thank you jane by doing such a great job the the woman behind the curtain um <laughs> <laughs> we we wanted to uh, also find out um, about the tools, right? Uh, automation tools are important. Without automation tools, we don't free up uh, ourselves to do to do important things. And so here we have looked at um, a variety of vendors. And the design of the survey was we asked for the top two uh, tools um, or the top two they they would recognize. Now 
please know, and as an analyst, I have to say this, this is not a representation of brand. Uh, this is just purely saying who has said that we would like to have these vendors in uh, as an automation tool. And they are ordered in alphabetical order. And you can see here, uh, Electric Cloud with Electric Flow, certainly one of the tools to know and to have in the list where management and leaders and, uh, and folks are actually saying, yeah, we would like you to have and possess that skill. And that's uh, just important to know relative to the automation. So with that, we've got 11 minutes. I wanna make some time for some questions. Uh, for those of you uh, who still have questions, I hope you do. Here are some conclusions. Um, while functional and technical skills are important, they're not enough. You must have more uh, to offer and you must be able to show evidence of those, which is important um, and actually part of hopefully some further research. Understanding how to positively impact customer experience is critical. Obviously, your management thinks that that's a must have skill. So there are some ideas. Go up and get up of your chair, walk over to your counterpart in application development, uh, meet with your customers whose application you're monitoring or managing, uh, or somewhere where you are releasing. Understand what are the key metrics in terms of the particular thing you're working on and how can that impact and how does it impact customer experience? If you don't ask those questions, um, you are not doing what you your management thinks. Practice and polish your soft your key soft skills every day. Um, again, you know, trying out new things. You can do that. Um, go and do and practice that with some of your counterparts uh, in a safe environment where you can maybe potentially work with some of your folks from the security team or from the application development team or your application developers work with the operations team on something which where you collaborate, where you cooperate, where you lead um, and start working on those. That's very, very important. And use your functional skills with DevOps. That doesn't mean, as Jane said, it's a T and not an I, but the T is made up of the individual capabilities and skills you have in your individual areas, but also with a global or a broadening of some of the, of the skills, which are a little bit more broad at the top of the T. Automation skills are important, but you must couple them with understanding what, when, and how to automate to actually add value. And this is nothing new. We've all been in this space and we all try to automate, but again, automation, and Sam said that correctly, automation, automating a mess is an additional, gives an additional mess. You have to automate intelligently and intelligent automation means you must understand process flows. Very important, again, we were not talking about that too much, but from our survey findings, companies are cultivating DevOps teams, DevOps teams from within. So your chance is now, your chance is now to step up to the plate and show what you have in terms of skills of those categories, which we have shared with you. Um, and then last but not least, there is some interesting research out there on having and showing an expandable mindset. Um, there's a doctor from Stanford, Dr. Shaw, who um, she says that having an expandable mindset is uh, the ability to expand into the T-shape. And she doesn't really say the T-shape, but it is very much um, that T-shape Jane was describing. So challenge yourself and become the T-shape DevOps human, because that's really what we need to sustain our growth in the business or in additional customer experience or citizen experience uh, or whatever vertical you're in. So thank you for listening. Here are some links, of course, to the DevOps Institute. Um, highly recommend to go there. The survey is, or the, the research is there as well. And with that, either comments from you, Jane and Sam, and or questions from the audience. Well, I'm hoping for some questions. So thank you. That was awesome. Really, really awesome. Deeper dive into the into the data. Sam, do you have anything you want to add? So we're seeing the uh, screen light up with a bunch of questions, which is great. Everybody is lots of thanks. I loved it. Hey, great information, all that good stuff. So thank you all for joining us and for listening. I agree. It is amazing data. I haven't said a lot because this is not our show. 
This is a DevOps Institute joint, and they've just done a fantastic job of helping to take the pulse of the market here. So there are a few questions we'll take. Um, one of the questions from Aaron uh, was, how about Linux skills? Did that come up as a focus for many companies? And I'll maybe expand that to just say open source. Um, was that um, part of this survey? And, and was that a factor in the characteristics that people were looking for? Yeah, Aaron, great question. Unfortunately, we didn't go further down <laughs> into the Linux and open source uh, details on the technology. Of course it is. I mean, that's my answer as an analyst, but we didn't survey that because we didn't want to ask people to answer 50 questions. We had to limit ourselves. And so at this point, um, we won't don't have that, but certainly something we hopefully can do as a sub-survey. Great idea. So we've had a lot of people asking also for a copy of the survey and a copy of the slides and where to replay the webinar. And Deb, the master of affairs over at DevOps.com has assured me that all of these will be available for people once the webinar is done. So thank you, Deb. Tip of the hat to her. Um, so I'll answer that question. So a couple of other questions. Um, Network and from this is from Steven network and database teams uh, Any thoughts on how to get network and database teams on board with DevOps? Ha huh, interesting it takes a longer conversation, but um, it, it It's probably very specific to you. Maybe there are is some challenges there But typically if we look at the stack of a application or of a service um, most of those have some kind of a database uh, component, right? At the same time, um, there is a network component. I mean, obviously. Um, so I, I would, I would potentially see and uh, understand. Can you somehow map out the, uh, the the service or the application you are leveraging or you're working on from a DevOps perspective, and see if those folks um, are interested in joining the availability and the performance. Um, of of the of the service you're working on, right? I think that would be the most natural one. Um, the second one, this is the technical answer. The second one would be, why are they not willing to be part of this? Is there something they're trying to, uh, you know, do differently? Are they are are they hesitant for a particular reason? I would confront them in a you know in a non non aggressive way and ask what the objections are and then deal with the objections one by one sometimes and this is the last comment um new things can be and devops again even so it might not be new to many uh who are listening here but in my experience sometimes new things can be a threat it can be a threat to those who have been in a silo for a long time it makes them uncomfortable it makes them um it, it just makes them uncomfortable. They want to be heroes and they want to stay there. Um, sometimes taking those silos down and just reaching over and shaking hands and inviting them to some kind of a scrum session or stand up session or a champagne party. That's what I would do. Uh, <laughs> or a coffee party. Uh, might, it might help. It brings and starts conversation. And as Jane said earlier, that collaboration starts with giving each other the time of the day, listen in, give them some thoughts, give them some ideas. And maybe that develops trust because trust might be at the bottom of the hesitation. And if you need more ideas, eearlich at devinstitute.com. Uh, send me an email. Happy to give you some additional advice. A, com a couple of other questions here. This one from Jorge. Um, so what do you say about a PMP with software engineer development experience? What value can a person with that background add on to a DevOps team? It's a great question. Uh, Jane, can I toss that to you? Sure. So, I mean, all skills are good skills. So even though we saw, say, project management or program management uh, not necessarily being a must-have skill, certainly there's a lot that we take forward with our journey of experience. So I think a, a project management professional, you saw software engineer is what, the number two or number three um, uh, role that's in the highest demand. I do think though that if you're looking at some of the the legacy frameworks uh, like ITIL or, or uh, project management, whether it's Prince2 
or PMI, you have to be able to adapt it to the future, right? So service management has to become agile service management and project management really needs to look at faster flows and, and uh, reducing perhaps some of the complexity that's associated with traditional project management. But I think any software engineering skill coupled with the understanding of how to deliver value in the form of product, you know, there's a lot of discussion about project to product. Uh, Mick Kirsten wrote a really great book about that recently, um, is something that will be in high demand. Awesome. All right, we've got another really good question that I want to make sure that we get to. Um, I, uh, so this is really a comment maybe, uh, but I think it's worth getting out there. Uh, Kayo, I think I'm saying his name right. I'm a DevOps engineer working in Germany for two years. I struggled to find a company with the correct mindset so that I can actually elevate my potential. The biggest fight is co to convince people in these companies that things need to change in order to get better. So I think this is a really interesting uh, point that even if you have all the skills, technical skills, Kayo's mentioning that the soft skill of being able to help people see that and help them change their mindset from a from a waterfall to a more agile way of thinking about solving problems is really really hard. Uh, so this is, I think, a, a fantastic comment. Jane or Evelyn, do you have any comments on this? I'll just yeah. say one sentence, Evelyn. Ahead, if you don't mind. There's a there's a mantra that says disrupt or get disrupted, right? So, or you know, I think a year from now when we start to see that uptake, more and more organizations are having to figure out that culture is either going to be their enabler or it's going to, um, you know, make them ripe for disruption. So I think you know I think it's a people effort, right, to be able to change that, and sometimes it's bottom up and top down. Yeah, Evelyn, I'm sorry, I jumped on that. Go ahead, Evelyn. No, no, that's okay. As I, as a German, uh, for those of you who were curious about my accent, um, I can see that being very difficult. Um, I, this is a short, it's not a, lo a short answer. So, Kayo, if you can, if you want to give me an email, um, and for the sake of, or Twitter me, I think it's uh, Twitter e, e Ehrlich or Ehrlich E at DevOpsInstitute.com. I'd be more than happy to help you. Um, really, just reach out because. It's, I can see that a challenge in Germany and I have some ideas for you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. It is the top of the hour. I appreciate everyone staying a minute extra. A uh, huge thank you to the DevOps Institute for uh, initiating the survey. Lots of props to Evelyn for crafting the survey and collecting these amazing uh, bits of information for us to now go off over the course of the year and try and digest. And again, help the humans of DevOps uh, to make sure that they're successful. None of this is going to work without people. So uh, at the end of the day, we have to pay attention to them and we need to help upskill them so that they can make sure that they are helping to propel our economy forward. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we'll thank see you, you all. Sam. Really, thank you, Electric Cloud, for your sponsorship and support. And I really hope everybody listening will download the report because there's a lot of good data in there. Absolutely. All Thank right. You. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks, Sam. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.